I wanted to, uh, to start by asking you to, to sort of tell the paper you wrote with Lick Lighter. Um, what, what, how did it come to be? I mean, what were sort of the events that led up to, to that paper? And <clears throat> well, um, uh, um, let's see. Lick's primary interest uh, in, in how and what a computer should do, uh, what he wanted it to do, uh, had to do with the uh, simulation and analysis of online experiments, scientific experiments. Uh, he started life as a, in psychoacoustics, and uh, uh, Wes Clark introduced him to computing uh, at Lincoln Lab uh, in the late 50s, I guess, early 60s, probably late 50s. Um, and he got uh, fascinated. The, T the TX2 was the computer there then, and it was interactive, uh, uh, although it was just one user at a time. And Lick got fascinated with that and uh, eventually, as you know, uh, went into changed fields, essentially. But uh, my interest in computing was always as a communications uh, medium. Uh, neither of us were interested in a computer as an arithmetic engine. Um, so uh, when I went to ARPA in 66, uh, I decided I, I wanted to build uh, the ARPANET as my sort of my contribution to that whole thing. Uh, and Lick and Ivan before me had uh, developed in interactive computing facilities called timesharing at that time. At, uh, several places around the country, MIT, uh, System Development Corporation in Santa Monica, Cal Berkeley, Project Genie, that were all funded by Lick and then by Ivan and then by me. <clears throat> and in my office in the Pentagon, I had terminals to all three of these systems, three different terminals. Uh, and so it, it was immediately obvious that this is silly, you know, you, why, not, why don't we just network them? Um, and, and furthermore, I had seen these time-sharing communities grow, uh, come into being, and it was a very interesting sociological phenomenon because you'd have a group of people, let's say, around MIT who initially would not know one another uh, and came to know one another because they happened to be all sharing the same facility. So you actually could see communities building. Uh, and that would happen any time uh, at all these places, that, uh, any time that uh, these interactive computing facilities were brought into existence. So when I went to ARPA and, and knew I wanted to start the ARPANET, uh, someone approached me from a magazine called International Science and Technology, which is now defunct, and uh, said, uh, well, why don't, why don't you uh, do an article for us on, uh, on this idea, this ARPANET business? And I said, well, mm, I think I'll get Lick to help me. Uh, nobody knows me. Nobody's ever heard of me. Uh, and uh, if Lick is a co-author, some people will pay attention to it. And he's also a very good writer. And so uh, I asked Lick, and he said, sure. Uh, we uh, had become friends back when I was at NASA. Um, and... Uh, I did my graduate work in psychoacoustics, so, um, and my thesis advisor was a good friend of Lick. So, in, in some sense, we had a lot in common, and that went quite, quite a ways back. So we were good friends, and that was a fun uh, thing to do, to jointly write this paper with him. And did the paper sort of lay out the, I mean, was, was it, did you, under, did you understand it as sort of a, um, an original vision statement for what you saw as the ARPANET? Yes. Very clearly. Yes, yes. That's right. And then it was, it was in the, the sort of the seeing the potential of a, of a, of a distributed network came from the time sharing, from your, your seeing the, time, the emergence of time sharing communities? Yes, but because of the interactive uh, com computing, uh, the difference between an interactive computing facility and a batch processing facility was enormous. <clears throat> and you could, you just saw relationships uh, develop, uh, and you saw people discovering in someone else a common interest that the original person would have, and and now they use the computer as a medium to uh, to explore that common interest. It was uh, it was 
quite a nice thing. And did you understand right from the beginning that it needed to be distributed to be scalable? Or was, you know? No, no, I didn't understand that at the, right at the beginning. Uh, the, the scalability came uh, as, a, as a byproduct of our wanting to build a personal computer. Now, in 1970, 69 or 70, uh, without knowing the name of Moore's Law, it was, it was still obvious to some of us what, it, what Moore's Law meant, uh, uh, an increase in performance and a, and a decrease in price every two years or so that was rather remarkable. And so it became clear that uh, in, in the early 70s that you could, we could now afford to put a machine on everyone's desk. Now, the, the trouble with that is that uh, if you do that, how are you going to enable the sharing of resources, of ideas, that you had in time sharing? The fact that a time sharing facility was a centralized facility meant that it was uh, automatically uh, a medium wherein people could share things because they were all using the same machine. They could share files, they could share data, they could send email all within that community. They, however, could not connect to some other community that had its time sharing system. So interactive computing was what time sharing enabled. And you, we knew then that you could build a personal computer and make it interactive. But how do you, how do you develop the sharing ability? You're going to have to connect them. That's where, that's where distributed comes from. And that's also by a byproduct of where scalability is now made uh, easier. So try to, uh, maybe it's wrong to separate these two visions. There's the, the, there's the vision of the personal computer, and there's the vision of the network community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, is it chicken and egg, or did the, did the did, were, you know, were sometimes the visions separate, were sometimes they the same? Um, in your mind, well, uh, I think, in my mind, the personal computer, uh, I assume, is connected. But in most people's mind, when the personal computer was first coming uh, available to people, uh, that's not the way they thought of them. I mean, the, the uh, IBM PC and the Macintosh were very poorly connected. Um, and so, to me, that was a different animal, uh, completely. Um, because uh, of my fixation about communication. Now, did, were you brought to ARPA to build an ARPANET, no. or did you come with that personal agenda? I, I developed that agenda uh, shortly after going there. No, I, I was brought to ARPA to help Ivan. Ivan was uh, the director of that office, and uh, he wanted uh, me, and Lick also encouraged me, to go and join that office as deputy director. And then Ivan, uh, shortly, within a year, was uh, doing some work out at NSA and then at Harvard. Uh, and so I became director uh, in, after being there uh, about a year. I became director in early 66. And <clears throat> I had already known that I wanted to build a network of interactive computing. So. Uh, once I became director, then I went in to see Charlie Hertzfeld, who was my boss. He was a great guy, still is. And uh, he, he liked the idea right away, and so we were off and running. And what was the first thing you did to implement, implement it? I mean, sort of, you, know, you had the idea. Well, the first thing I did was <clears throat> start talking to uh, my contractors, the people I was funding, because I, I had to have their cooperation. <clears throat> I said, look, I want to you all understand the value of a network community that's local. Uh, what I want to do is uh, make that global. So that if you're sitting at the uh, University of Utah in, a, in your time sharing facility and you wanted to connect to someone <clears throat> at MIT uh, in their time sharing facility as though you were connecting to someone at Utah, that we should be able to make that possible. And I, I had some responses that were uh, Good, positive. Oh, that sounds interesting. Yes, others uh, were. Well, I don't know if I want somebody else messing around with my resources. So I, I had to spend a lot of time doing that. And another thing I started doing immediately was trying to recruit a program manager. Uh, and I wanted Larry Roberts to be a program manager. There were other candidates, but uh, my my preference was Larry. Uh, well, he wasn't interested. 
Um, and I tried for a year to, almost a year, to, to get him uh, to come, and he just wouldn't do it. He was doing work in, interesting work at Lincoln Lab in graphics and other things. I had asked him uh, a year earlier to uh, do a test, uh, a cross-country test of sending bits uh, on telephone lines to learn something about reliability. And so he had uh, got subcontracted with uh, Tom Merrill to develop a uh, test between the, the TX2 at Lincoln and the Q32 at SDC. And that worked out reasonably well. But uh, he wanted to stay at Lincoln and, and continue doing what he was doing. So one day it occurred to me that uh, ARPA funded 51% uh, of Lincoln Lab. So I went back to see Charlie Hertzfeld and said, uh, would, would you mind calling the director of Lincoln Lab and ask him to tell, call Roberts in and tell Roberts that it would be in his best interest and ARPA's best interest if Roberts would take this job? And Charlie said, sure. And while with me in his office, he picked up the phone and called Jerry Deneen at Lincoln Lab. And I heard Charlie's end of the conversation. It was short. And two weeks later, Larry accepted the job. So that was good. And uh, th then, then we were really off and running uh, because, uh, I mean, Larry, Larry had some of the same troubles I had with uh, convincing some of the principal investigators that, that we weren't going to muck around with their facilities too much. Where was the first, you know, the, 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 the IMP architecture, where did that get laid out? I mean, not done, but where did the... The, the idea came from Wes Clark. Uh, the, Larry's original idea was, let's run this thing uh, from a big computer in Nebraska. Uh, I was appalled at that. So I, I uh, talked to Wes and to Lick uh, about that idea. And... Uh, Ultimately, not too long thereafter, at a meeting uh, at the University of Michigan of these principal investigators, Wes was there, Larry was there, uh, and this question came up and uh, Wes unloaded the idea of the imp, uh, and it was, a, it was a wonderful idea for many, in many ways. Uh, it was sociologically, it's a wonderful idea because it means that you've got distributed control, uh, to the extent there is any, of uh, an interactive network, whereas if you'd had a central machine running the whole thing, then you would have had absolute central control. Uh, <clears throat> and, it, and it was, the idea fit with a lot of the values that we had then. We, uh, it, communication was what we were after, uh, individual freedom is a part of that. Um, so the whole set of values that were almost intuitively realized as people contributed to the building of the ARPANET, the protocols. It was all a very uh, democratic, highly participative enterprise uh, that did not have any of the institutional or organizational shackles that people are, are often accustomed to and things like that. So it was wonderful. I have the sense that technologies never emerge in a vacuum. That the, the surrounding events in society mm -hmm. tend to mediate the particular form of the technology. But that's, that's, a, that's a very high level theory. Well, it's true, I think. When you come down to the specific events that happened around um, uh, uh, Doug Engelbart's group at SRI mm -hmm. and the Park group, mm -hmm. and then the surrounding sort of cultural and political chaos in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain that they're interrelated, but I've never understood how one affected the other. And I was just wondering if you hmm. could think about that for a second. Yeah, there was a lot of, as you say, there was a lot of political turmoil, anxiety, uh, uh, disturbance uh, going on at the time, uh, inter locally and nationally and internationally. And the excitement that was present at, in the, within uh, Doug's group, at Doug Engelbart's group at SRI, and the, and the Park group, uh, was almost as though uh, it was a place to go and something to do that that uh, was a retreat from this angst that was present. Uh, so I've never I've never come up with an idea as to how one affected the other. 
uh, except in, in uh, the sense that you could get caught up in the excitement of your work and you didn't care much about what else was happening. The, the irony of the, the world's top-down organization being responsible, you know, basically developing the technology that's created one of the most democratic explosions in history is, I mean, is there irony there or? Well, ARPA was not a typical uh, Pentagon or Department of Defense organization. It had a great deal of freedom. Its directors were scientists, not bureaucrats. And it's uh, this freedom, this this sort of tradition of freedom in, that was in ARPA in those days was passed down to the op various office directors. So <clears throat> as, as director of the, their computer research part called Information Processing Techniques Office, I, I had uh, enormous freedom to do uh, what I wanted to do. I had, I had no committees to worry about, no, if I wanted to start a project, uh, I would, I'd had to get approval from my, from the director of ARPA and that was it. Uh, quite unlike uh, the way other research is funded by the government where you have peer committees and uh, various and sundry uh, groups that have to approve before you can launch something. So it was a quite unfettered uh, and uh, freewheeling organization. He spoke recently at the Computer History Museum din dinner, and he made a couple of ref references to that period being ended by the Mansfield Amendment. Is mm. that I had never heard that particular history before. Uh, I'm not sure the, the extent to which the Mansfield Amendment really uh, had uh, much of an effect, although it certainly had an effect in some people's minds. Uh, it was about what it was about was that. Uh, it, it, it spoke to the fact that if the Defense Department is going to support uh, research, it, it should be mission-oriented research. Uh, that's a contradiction in terms, of course, uh, but that's what it was about. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know that it was ever uh, actually brought to bear on anything real, but I do know that there were people in the Defense Department and, and in, or even in ARPA uh, who uh, paid some attention to it. Uh, it so it did cast a, uh, some, some, something of a pall over, uh, over the kind of research that they were, that ARPA was supporting at the time. But as I say, I, I, I'm not sure its effect was anything more than something in people's minds, some people's minds, uh, which of course you can say, uh, well, that's an effect, uh, e e even though it's not legally implemented. Remember, was it in your graduate work or your time at NASA um, that you came to see um, computing as having applic applicability broader than data processing? Obviously, by the time you were at DARPA, you had this vision of communications. And was there a particular event or a set of events that sort of shaped your view of computing as, as a broader tool? There wasn't a particular event, uh, no, but uh, I read uh, Lick Leiter's paper uh, called Man Computer Symbiosis in 1960, um, actually before I went to NASA. It was published in March of 1960. Uh, and uh, that had, a, that had a, a marked effect on how I thought about computing. I, I read that paper and said, yep, that's right. That paper wasn't about comp the computer as a communication medium, but it was about uh, interactive computing. and, and uh, it's not a large step to go from interactive computing to, to the next uh, idea about communication. And then um, while I was at NASA, uh, I learned more about computing and, and began to see uh, the development uh, in small ways of interactive computing. Uh, Bo Brannick and Newman had a PDP-1. They had a time, little time-sharing system on it. I've, I uh, had contracts, NASA contracts at Bo Brannick and Newman. I would go up there and play around with that. PDP-1 a little bit on occasion. Uh, <clears throat> I had contracts over at MIT and uh, interactive computing had little bits and pieces of uh, exploratory work there. So that all accumulated gradually. So yes, by the time I left NASA, uh, it was the, the, the importance of the computer as a communications medium was obvious to me. Uh, yes, I uh, saw space war early on. There was a space war on the PP-1 at BBN. Uh, there was uh, 
Space War early on, uh, I don't remember how early, at uh, MIT and Stanford. Uh, so, yes, that was, that was a lot of fun. Any sense that, you know, that I think the, uh, the video game industry in America is now just ready to surpass the, uh, the, the uh, movie theaters in box office revenue? I mean, was... <laughs> did, uh, the computer is uh, an entertainment medium, uh, is uh, closely associated with the computer as a communications medium. Uh, we had a, a game at Xerox Park called Trek that uh, I still haven't seen uh, a computer game uh, that could quite match it. Uh, you, uh, it was patterned after Star Trek. You could, you could be a Romulan, a Klingon, or a Terran and fly one of those, those three ships. Each of those ships had different properties. You, we'd get on, I'd take my kids up to a park at night and we'd all, each of us would get on a different computer and there would be lots of other people at park on their altos, and all these altos were networked through the Ethernet. So you'd have maybe 50 or, or more people scattered around the building, each of them uh, flying their own spaceship, sitting at their own alto, and they and you would inter, inter, interact. You know, if you were a Terran, well, you'd farm up with other Terrans, and you'd go look for Klingons and try to shoot them down. And it was a, a very rich uh, game. I mean, it had lots of different properties. You had to, you had to. Uh, be sure that you didn't run out of fuel or ammunition and you had procedures for going to get more of these things and you could get injured and some of your crew would be killed and you'd have to go back and get more crew and it was quite complicated. Um, there were many different star clusters and you could, uh, stargates could have you go into warp speed and you could jump from one cluster to another. It's like changing the solar system to some other system. Um, and it was, uh, you could, we'd entertain ourselves for hours doing this. I'm one of the people who, and I think there are many, many people who sort of can say their life was changed by seeing the Alto. And I, I can't think that there are very many other, I mean, I've now seen a lot of things and nothing had the impact. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it was true even of Steve Jobs. Well, Steve Jobs missed the networking. That's right, he didn't see it all. That convert the, the you know the convergence of events that led to the to the Alto. Um, were you at? Uh, did you go directly from ARPA to Xerox, or was no, I was at the University of Utah for a year. That's uh, I had known Alan Kay before, but that's but I got to know him better there. He was a graduate student there when I was there. And what led you to Xerox from the University of Utah? Um, Xerox was starting a new research center in Palo Alto, and. Um, the uh, head of that research center called me and asked me to, if I'd come to Palo Alto and uh, consult with him on this new research center. It wasn't a, a job interview from, from my point of view. Um, Wes Clark uh, uh, was a friend of, of this chap. His name was George Paik. And uh, so I guess Wes had recommended me. I'm not sure. But anyway, I went out and talked to him. and. Uh, they said uh, that uh, Xerox had just bought uh, scientific data systems recently, and so they were going to set up a research group in uh, Palo Alto, uh, in part to carry out research in support of scientific data systems, now called XDS, Xerox Data System. And I opined as how that was too bad that they were going to do that. And uh, they, they said, well, why? And I, and I said, because nobody I know would want to go work in a, in a group that was in support of XDS because XDS doesn't know what business they ought to be in. They, they had been building batch processing machines for the aerospace industry and quite, quite good computers for doing what they were doing. Uh, but I had uh, had an uh, encounter, let, let us say, with Max Pileski back in the Pentagon in my ARPA days. We had, ARPA had funded uh, the timesharing system at UC Berkeley called Project Genie, and they had bought an SDS machine, 930, and rewired it and put a time-sharing system on it. And uh, I asked Berkeley to people to tell SDS people to come visit me in ARPA because I want to see if I can't get them to turn this into a product. The operating system of software had already been paid for by the taxpayers' money, so it was public domain, they could have it. 
and uh, it would be a marvelous thing to get timesharing out into the commercial world. And so Pileski uh, showed up in my office with a number of his staff one day in the Pentagon, despite when I was still in ARPA. And I laid out this proposition for him, and he said, uh, no. Uh, and I said, what? Why not? And he said, because it won't sell. And I, I couldn't believe this, you know. And so I tried to argue with him a little bit, and he said, no, oh, this, is, this is a crazy, uh, wild idea by some university people. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. It, 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 you know, I'm a businessman. This, this, this is just silly. Well, I lost my temper, and I, I said, you're wasting my time. And I threw him out of the office, not physically, but I said, leave, you know. And he and his people left. And a few minutes later, one of his guys came back in. His name was Rigdon Curry. You might know him. And uh, he, he, uh, he's a venture capitalist up here now, I believe. But he, uh, he was head of the uh, marketing and sales for SDS on the East Coast, which is why he happened to come along for this meeting. And he came back in and said, may I talk to you? I said, sure. And he said, uh, you know, I think you're right. And Max is, Pileski's wrong. I said, uh, well, I know. <laughs> and he's wrong. <laughs> he said, how, how can I help? And I said, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I've got a terminal here to the Berkeley system, SDS 930, uh, here in my office in the Pentagon. And uh, you can use, I, I use the Berkeley system from here from time to time. You could do the same thing. In fact, you could line up customers and bring them up here to the Pentagon and send them down to this machine and demonstrate this system. He said, oh, you're on. And he did that, and within a few months, they had, uh, he had about 20 customers with dollars in their pocket outside Max Pilevsky's door saying, we want this machine. Turn it into a product. So Max Pilevsky sort of caved in. I mean, they did put it out as a product. It sold uh, hundreds. But they always contracted out the software, so they never internalized the software. To bring the, and they called it an SDS 940, and to bring it up on their line, they would bring up a 930 completely take it through all the way through acceptance tests, then tear it down, the part that needed to be torn out, to add memory protection, and then put it onto a 940 line. You know, they never internalized it as a, as a product. You know, it was always an orphan. So when it was time, but they sold a lot of them, and when it was time to upgrade uh, their line, they designed and built a Sigma 7, which they advertised as a time-sharing system that was going to surpass the 940. And so they got a lot of uh, orders, letters of intent to order Sigma 7s. People were so impressed with the 940, they were sure they were going to like the Sigma 7. As soon as the Sigma 7 came out and people saw what a botched design it was, they, uh, t they reneged on all of their letters of intent and ordered PDP 10s. So it put the PDP 10 on the map and it, uh, it told the world that SDS was not a company that was going to succeed when it comes to interactive computing. So then we come back to, to Park. Right. So I had this experience with SDS, and that's why I told uh, Paik that, uh, that that wasn't going to be a very interesting enterprise. And he, he said, well, what do you think we ought to do? And I said, Xerox is in the office, and uh, digital technology is going to revolutionize the office. Um, and Xerox has a great opportunity to make that happen. So uh, build, a, build a research group that is, de is dedicated to that. And they, and Paik and uh, someone else was in his office with him, they sort of nodded their head and said, well, thank you very much. And I went back to Salt Lake City from Palo Alto saying, well, that's all I'm going to hear of that. Uh, and that's fine with me. <clears throat> so. A week or two later, I got a call. Would I come back I'm from Paik? Would I come back to uh, Palo Alto and talk with him? So I did. And he said, well, well we, want to, uh, we want you to come here and rec you, you know a lot of us, the smart people in, in computing. We want you to come and recruit uh, people and build a lab. And, uh, and we agreed that, uh, that I would do that, and, but that, we, that I wasn't going to build a lab that was 
going to carry out research in support of SDS. So, uh, I was going to do build a lab that was going to do what I had already outlined earlier. And furthermore, I didn't want to direct this lab, you know. Uh, from I, 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 I want to be Mr. Inside as far as the lab is concerned. I don't want to be Mr. Outside because I don't want to have to spend my time talking to the Max Pileskis of this world. Um, and so we agreed that that's fine and that I could recruit the guy who was going to be my boss, in effect. And uh, that's, what, that's how I got started at Park. You just said something to me about the irony of the, the Sigma 7 um, and the SDS 940 were the first two computers to talk over the ARPANET. Is that the, is that the history? Did I get that right, I, Bill? I think that's right. It's, yeah, un un understood. So what did, you know, people go back and try to figure out the roots of innovation and it's always sort of lost. What decisions did you make at the start that made it possible for the things that led to the various, I mean, what, what did you do right in, in retrospect? Uh, well, you mean at ARPA or at PARC oh, or both? At PARC. Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, I think the best thing I did at Park was hire uh, Butler, Lamson, Chuck Thacker, Ed McCry, Jim Mitchell, Jim Morris, Jim Horning, a ton of really good people, uh, and uh, ultimately convinced them uh, after they got their next time sharing system out of their systems, out of their souls, they ultimately convinced them to build the Alto system. Uh, I could, there, there are probably 30 or 40 of these guys who are superstars. Uh, Charles Simonia is one, Chuck Geschke, John Warnock, people that, Bob Metcalf, people that uh, are now quite recognizable uh, as people who've made big successes of themselves. So you went on a mission to find this nucleus of the best thinkers or doers. In who, who I knew had experience with the kind of research that I wanted to see carried out. I knew could develop the kind of thing that I wanted to have developed. But other people have now tried to do the same thing, and I would submit that it never has come out the same way. So, was there something else? Well, or did you just happen to? I, w I, I was uh, timing uh, the, the timing of the technology. What was happening to the technology then? Uh, the integrated circuit was just now uh, beginning to uh, become uh, available. We uh, we had the first machine we built at Park was a was a time sharing machine that that emulated a PDP-10, and it was the first machine to use semiconductor memory. It used 1103s from Intel, so that's a step in the right direction. Uh, and uh, Moore's law was becoming obvious. Um, we had I had a I knew the set of people who had developed interactive computing in under ARPA research, so I, I knew of a special set of talents that existed uh, that, n that uh, other people didn't have. Uh, so a whole set of things came together. Uh, Xerox wanted to build a new lab. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have uh, backward compatibility, so to speak, that, that hindered us. We, you know, we didn't have to follow any traditions of who was there before us because we were there first. So uh, there were many ingredients uh, that kept us uh, unfettered and gave us opportunities to do these things. Let me go backwards. Um, did you overlap, did your period at ARPA overlap um, Doug Engelbart's, were, were you his first funder? Or I funded him from NASA first. Well, his first funder was, a, was, was the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. They gave him a small amount of money. I again gave him from NASA a larger amount of money in 62. I believe it's when uh, uh, he and Bill English uh, and others invented the mouse under a, under a NASA contract. Was, uh, NASA, it's funny, NASA was for, for a while in the 70s was fond of talking about spin-offs to the, <clears throat> to the domestic economy and so they would talk about Tang and uh, non-slick uh, frying pans and Teflon and God knows what. And they never caught on to the fact that the mouse was invented under a NASA contract, but it was. That's great. <laughs> the invention that had of all NASA inventions the most impact. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 
what, what was... What did you see that was special about Doug? Oh, my goodness. Well, uh, a dedicated, uh, a guy who's single-mindedly dedicated to a large idea, a very large idea, an idea that he still doesn't, is not happy with uh, the, the result. Uh, uh, I mean, he still thinks we haven't gone far enough, and from his point of view, we haven't. Um, he, he really wanted to see the computer revoli revolutionize the way in which people work together, people solve, solve problems together, people in, uh, in enterprises where you have to, a lot of cooperation and have to have close-knit cooperation. And the system that he and his people built at SRI was the first such system that really enabled that. It was called NLS. And it was uh, quite a remarkable system. I've heard from time to time that you had to act as something of a protector for Doug. <laughs> that, I mean, that you... Yes, well, <clears throat> yes. He, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I didn't, I don't, I don't remember all of Doug's managers, his bosses that he had at, at SRI, but I remember one uh, who came to visit me uh, first in NASA. I'm not, I don't remember if he visited me in ARPA or not. See, I funded Doug from NASA, and then when I went to ARPA, I increased his funding. Lick, I, I told Lick about Doug. When I was in NASA and Lick was in ARPA. And so Lick funded Doug as well while I was from NASA. And then when I went to ARPA, I increased his funding. So it, I had to, so I would talk with Doug's bosses from time, time to time. And I talked to a couple of them who didn't have the foggiest idea what Doug was trying to do. And one of them asked me, why in the world are you funding this? And uh, I, I was, you know, I, this floored me. Uh, and, and so I launched into a uh, probably a diatribe explaining to this guy why he ought to understand this is damn important work. And he ought to be proud to be uh, sheltering it, taking care of it. Did you see early on, um, there seems to be a, a linkage or maybe an overlap between Licklider's vision and Engelbart's vision. Was that something you were aware of? Am I right that there was? And were you aware of it? Yes, there was an there was overlap in the sense that they arrived at their visions independently. And uh, probably over about the same period of time, as far as I can tell. Uh, as far as I can tell, they came to these sets of interests in the late 50s, sometimes second half of the 50s. And uh, I, I, le I learned about Lick's vision before I learned about Engelbart's vision. But I later, uh, I, had, I was also influenced by uh, uh, Vannevar Bush's uh, 1945 uh, article in Atlantic, I believe it was, and I had read that, uh, I guess when I was in college, or maybe when I was in the Navy, and I had also read, uh, while I was in college, some of Norbert Wiener's stuff, uh, The Human Use of Human Beings, cybernetics book. Uh, so when I read Lick's paper, the three influences that sort of came together for me then, uh, Norbert Wiener, uh, the Atlantic monthly paper by um, what's his name? Yeah. Well, anyway, Bush. yeah, Vannevar Bush, right? Vannevar Bush. Three things came together for me: Vannevar Bush's paper, um, and Lick's paper, and Norbert Wiener's uh, work. And uh, and that was the. It was only later that I discovered that Vannevar Bush had also had an influence on Engelbart. So there was, there was commonality there uh, amongst the three of us, uh, but uh, they, were, they were very independent. And one thing I realized, I think I realized just recently about Engelbart's ideas is he came across his ideas at a time when society was obsessed with automation. And I think that his idea was actually very different. A augmentation is sort of in opposition to mm -hmm. automation in yeah. a sense. And that, I've always thought, I mean, since I realized this, I think there's something there. I'm not quite sure I fully realized it, but I think that that's an important distinction from, was it a different use of computing or was it a... Yes, I, I, yes. Just as Licks wa was. I mean, that, they had that in common as well. They, they neither were interested in the traditional or uh, currently, uh, at the time, uh, favored views of what a computer is all about. They both uh, wanted the computer to take off in a, a different direction than than it was doing at the time. Um, it still seems to me that there were just a very few ideas, and since then, 
everything has been derivative. I mean, maybe there was one other idea which also came out of Park later, which was ubiquitous computing. But it, it, it still seems to me that the computer industry writ large and even consumer electronics is still thrashing with a very few ideas and trying to implement them to better or lesser degrees. Does, does that match your, your sense of the well, development of modern hmm, computing? Uh, um, it's hard to say, but you know, you, probably uh, let, let's go back to the 60s and imagine someone who had developed some computing technology in the 50s, and he's looking at this thing called time sharing, let's say, that's just new in the 60s. And he could say, well, <clears throat> that's not really new. I mean, we had, we had computers uh, and operating systems and so on in the 50s, and this is just sort of a wrinkle on that. You could, you, you could make that argument. And so uh, it's, uh, it, it, you know, I, I think the things that are different now uh, that will really make a difference in terms of how people that, that affect people and how they use computing is an enormous increase in bandwidth that we're going to get uh, over time. And uh, the enormous reduction in power that's going to make things possible and make things smaller and lighter and more portable. Um, and uh, those, those two, uh, plus Moore's Law will continue, those three phenomena alone are going to give people a lot of things to do in terms of new research opportunities and new worlds to conquer. Well, w w let me ask you first: what, what did what did you what took you to Vietnam um, when you were at ARPA? Um, all right, um, Lyndon Johnson was running the war out of the White House, and he was getting uh, reports separate reports from each of the services in Vietnam, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, on uh, captured materials, supplies, uh, bullets, uh, various and sundry logistics reports. <clears throat> and these reports were not coordinated, and so uh, uh, he'd get conflicting reports. Uh, the Army would be out of bullets, uh, and the Marine Corps has plenty of bullets, things, things like that. It was driving him nuts, so he asked McNamara to fix it. McNamara calls the director of ARPA and says, don't you have a computer guy or something? Go out there and find out what the hell's going on. So <clears throat> my boss calls me in and tells me what's going on, and so I have to go get a bunch of shots and, uh, and get ID that, uh, that you, if you're a civilian and you're taking into a combat zone, you have to have. There's a funny story about that. Quickly, I'll tell you. They uh, they gave me they took my picture and gave me two of these little IDs, and uh, on on the back it says that my equivalent uh, military rank is a general in the U.S. Army. And I said, why are you giving me two of these? And they said, well, because if you get captured, you give one to the enemy and you keep the other one. God. Military, bless their hearts. So anyway, I, I when I left. Uh, Arpa, I kept one of these and gave the other one in. And when I went out to Utah, Utah, Salt Lake City was dry, and so I used this card to join the officers' club, and I was popular. I could go in to take people to to the bar and have them give them a drink. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so, so I went out to I I took uh, three members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff with me: an Army Colonel, an, an Air Force Colonel, and a, and a Navy a Lieutenant Commander. And we went out to Vietnam, and uh, they spread out amongst their services and found out what was happening and got back with me. And uh, we, we saw that, okay, we're going to have to send a small group out here and have them redesign their logistics reporting system, make sure that they all use the same definitions uh, of things that they're uh, talking about, either captured stuff or supplies that, they're, that they need to be shipped into them. Uh, and uh, so we we did that, and then we set up a little computer center at Tonsonook. Uh, this cost this took several trips, but uh, and uh, from there on, the Johnson just got one report to the White House. Uh, it probably it probably still was full of uh, erroneous facts, <laughs> but never mind. It, at least they weren't conflicting now anymore, and he was happy. Uh, and I learned uh, when I first went out to Vietnam, I I thought that. Uh, we belong there, that uh, 
there were, there were people that were t that were uh, killing other people and they shouldn't be and and uh, we were out there to try to protect the people that were being uh, attacked uh, but after about my second or third trip uh, during which I had talked with a number of Vietnamese uh, I learned that this was a civil war uh, we had no business in. We had, we had no understanding of, of, of how this culture worked. And we ought to get out of there as quickly as we could. So it really, uh, it was an interesting education for me, that, uh, that part of it. Also, um, were you there before or after Tet? I was there both before and after. There was, um, at the same time that, that you guys were doing the stuff that could be related to personal computing and networking at Park and, and, and at Augman, um, uh, there was this homebrew movement outside. And I wanted to get your sense of, this was, you know, the uneducated masses sort of, and this hunger for personal computing. Do you have some sense of so what was going on in the, in the broader society? Yes, um, but uh, for those of us who had uh, fairly rich computing resources at that time, those, those uh, groups looked like hobbyists uh, you know, to us, and, and, and small-time hobbyists in some sense. Um, we could understand... Uh, their excitement in terms of uh, their wanting to do things with small pieces of computing, but from our point of view, they wouldn't be able to do things that we would consider very interesting. Uh, but of course, as we all know now, the uh, homebrew computer club and the hobbyists and computing uh, in, in uh, the 60s uh, played an important role because they brought the consciousness of computing to a lot of people. Um, so, you know, technically they, they uh, may not have made a whole lot of contribution, but sociologically they made enormous contributions. Um, they were not uh, educated in computing technology, particularly. They were just interested in seeing what they could do as, as hobbyists. Uh, whereas the, the folks who were funded by ARPA and, uh, and later uh, Xerox and, and uh, had a lot of money, relatively speaking, and they could uh, build serious, more serious systems and, and also play with them in, in much in, in the same sense that the hobbyists were playing with their stuff. Um, but I, I, I remember Alan Kay once saying to me that uh, he said there's two groups uh, of people who pioneered computing. He said uh, one group who could read and another group who couldn't. And he's right about that. They were, they were uh, both important. There were at least two attempts to, to write histories of Park. And I was wondering if you've looked at either and have some sense of whether anybody yet has gotten it right. Uh, yes, if you're talking about fumbling the future uh, and, and, then, and dealers of lightning. Uh, yeah, both of those books uh, are uh, reasonably accurate. Um, there are mistakes, of course, in, in both, but uh, they're not uh, large mistakes. Uh, I think Dealers of Lightning is a little more interesting because it gets into uh, some, some sociological and psychological stuff and doesn't concentrate so much on the corporate uh, shenanigans that were going on. Uh, but Fumbling the Future does concentrate more on that, and that's valuable for people who want to understand that. Only the future looks a little bit more like a Harvard case study, probably, than uh, Dealers of Lightning. But uh, De Dealers of Lightning is, I think, uh, more fun to read and easier to read. Uh, my, my only uh, uh, criticism about either book is, is that uh, there are an awful lot of people who deserve a lot of credit, uh, and they don't get much. Many of those people don't get much credit in either book. Some do, but many don't. And, and furthermore, there are some people in, in both books who get some credit that they don't deserve. So, uh, but you can never, <laughs> you can never get it all, all right. And by and large, uh, I'd, g I'd give both books good marks. Both um, 
Fairchild and Xerox uh, Park served as sort of, um, what's the word, where the sort of the, the seed that leads to this diaspora or whatever it is. And, um, petri dish or petri something? Petri dish or something. I mean, it, where there was a remarkable amount of uh, Silicon Valley innovation startup uh, spin out. Um, is that a success or a failure? I mean, I, what, do you have oh, it, it, I think it's, it's clearly a success. Uh, but there's some irony here. I mean, we call it Silicon Valley. Now, what is silicon? Silicon sand, and out of it you make integrated circuits. What, what's an integrated circuit? It's a piece of hardware. That's, that's the Fairchild part of the story. But uh, Park, Park didn't make hardware. I mean, Park, Park bought pieces and put, it, put stuff together. Uh, the people who made hardware were obeying physical laws. Uh, the people who built the software were uh, obeying logical laws. And, uh, but we don't call it, we don't call the valley the physical logical valley, we call it the physical valley. So uh, it wouldn't be much of a Silicon Valley if it weren't for the uh, Xeroxes, the Apples, the Suns, the Adobe's, the the um, all these companies that fundamentally uh, have made the computer what it is because of software. Um, a cultural question about Park, and I don't know if it was intentional or not, but um, there are two um, office plants in Silicon Valley that are that are uh, competing. One is uh, Hewlett Packard's Open Plan. And the other, I think, traces back to Xerox Park, which is a closed plant where people actually had offices. Did you think about that? Was that? Oh yes, yes. Tell me the story of trying to build a open plan offices uh, were uh, in existence then, um, but uh, when we uh, built Park, uh, we needed uh, offices for people to have uh, acoustic privacy first of all. Um, and uh, a sense that, uh, that, they, that if they wanted to protect themselves from interruption, that they could. Uh, and so open plan offices were never considered. Uh, when you, pro writing a computer program is very much like writing a book or a letter or anything else. If you're drawn away from it, even for a moment, you've, lo you've lost your train of thought. Uh, and it makes you very inefficient. So uh, when, when you're writing anything, I think you need to, to concentrate and you need your environment, your physical environment, to encourage that uh, state of affairs as, as strongly as possible. Now, w we also wanted uh, a lot of informality at, at Park. And so to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, give you physical privacy, uh, but still make it possible for someone to find you if they wanted to find you, and, and to give the place uh, a light feeling, and bring in as much sunlight uh, from the outside as you could. We used lots of glass, both, both inside walls and outside walls. <clears throat> um, and our conference room um, had no conference table in it and no conference chairs. It, it, had, it was full of bean bags. And when I went to the uh, Xerox facilities manager to f equip the conference room initially. I said, we found these bean bags up in Berkeley and that's what we want for our conference room. And he said, hey, you can't do that. And uh, I said, why not? He said, it it's not, doesn't meet corporate standards. And I said, well, what are corporate standards? And I said, well, you have to have a big conference table and uh, chairs that are designed, you know, to go all to go together around the conference table. I said, how much did one of those chairs cost? He said, about three to $500. I said, a bean bag costs $35. I said, uh, you either let us get bean bags or I'm going to write a memo to corporate saying that we had to buy these chairs instead. He says, okay, you can have your bean bag. Bill wants to ask uh, dealer next. Dealer? Mm -hmm. I don't have it quite right, Bill. What was the, oh, you know what I'm, what, mm -hmm. he said it was an interesting part of the culture that grew from the components. And so I, I tell me about it because okay. I don't know about it. Okay. Well, w w the thing, uh, one of the things we use this conference room for that I just told you about was a weekly meeting of the entire lab, computer science lab. The meeting was called Dealer because uh, <clears throat> I would have uh, one particular researcher, a different one each time, uh, take charge of the meeting much as uh, in a poker game the dealer decides what the game is. 
uh, and sets the rules, you know, like one-eyed jacks are wild or they're not or whatever. And the person who had, uh, who was the main speaker for that week's meeting would be a researcher who uh, would talk to the group, the whole group, about uh, what the researcher was doing, the work that they were doing. And he could set the rules to, uh, to, to, to the point of saying, okay, you can't interrupt me until I'm done, or I'll take questions anytime you wish. Uh, and he also set the topic. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he could, ex or she could expect to get grilled uh, by uh, this audience. And this audience was an outstanding set of grillers, as you can imagine. I mean, they were all uh, very brilliant, uh, articulate people and critical. Um, and uh, so a culture uh, developed uh, whereby uh, it was important to uh, help someone evaluate or, or critique their own idea. And it was also important that the criticism was about the idea and not about the person. And that was widely recognized and practiced. Uh, and it was necessary to the kind of work we were doing because all these people were working on different pieces of things that ultimately had to fit together in very complicated ways. You, there's nothing uh, logically more complicated than a, than a computer program of any size. Uh, so it was important that everyone know something about what everyone else was doing. Uh, and that was probably the most significant part of the culture. Kind of research discussion that might take place. What would be a, what, what's one that you remember? Well, I don't remember any one uh, in particular. I, but I can tell you, I can characterize it for you. The, uh, someone will be designing uh, some, uh, uh, or trying to solve some problem having to do with the operating system, let us say, <clears throat> or with the uh, design of uh, some of the printing software, let us say. And uh, they would say, okay, here's the problem I'm up against, and this is the way I think I'm going to go about it. I went about it this way uh, last week, and that didn't work for the following reasons. And you're at a white, the, the person who's saying all this is at a whiteboard, and he's, you know, illustrating what he's talking about, and he's into it. So it's, it's a discussion about uh, uh, what he's faced with at the moment, usually, and he's uh, oftentimes looking for help. Maybe one one last. When and why did ne the, did Park's golden era end? <laughs> well, because a number of us finally realized that Xerox wasn't Xerox wasn't going to do anything with it except laser printing, and uh, we wanted to go somewhere where uh, we would have uh, a greater impact, and uh, that's what we did. Where did Xerox's corporate failure to sort of see the breadth come from? I mean, is it as simple as...? Well, there, uh, there are several uh, answers to that, I think. Um, first of all, the Xerox was a, is a copier company, uh, and so to, ex to the extent that they uh, uh, understand technology, it's analog technology in those days. Um, furthermore, they were a marketing company, not a technology company. Uh, so uh, their, their interest in uh, technology was uh, not great. Um, and finally, uh, there were, the, the Japanese were making serious inroads into their copier revenue. Uh, so many of them felt they could ill afford to pay attention to a new technology when the technology that, that had made them what they are was uh, in jeopardy. Now, there were other cultural uh, properties that uh, con contributed to this. Those, those are the main uh, contributors, but I'll tell you of one other. <clears throat> we, um, Park put on a uh, demonstration <clears throat> of uh, all of these different technologies, the personal distributed computing, the word processing, the laser printing, the desktop publishing, etc. at a demonstration that we set up in Boca Raton, Florida in the 70s, the second half of the 70s, 
uh, at a meeting of the top 250 Xerox executives called by the chairman of the board, a uh, three-day meeting, and, and they gave us, the park people, the last day called Futures Day. And we put on an extravaganza uh, all morning long in a big auditorium sh demonstrating this stuff up on the stage. And in the afternoon, we, we had uh, individual uh, demonstration booths set up in, in uh, another large room in this complex with, with uh, park people there to help these uh, 250 executives and their wives come through and get hands-on experience with this stuff. And I don't know how many demonstration booths there were. There's probably a dozen or more of these diff doing different things. And uh, I was there and wa watching this, and a strange thing happened very quickly. The men were all standing back. Uh, the women were going up and sitting down and asking questions and fooling around with the keyboard and fooling around with the mouse. And it dawned on us, finally, that for this, these men, for that generation, uh, typing is something you don't do. You know, that's a that's a mundane activity. And many of these women had had jobs as secretaries and didn't weren't bothered about typing at all. So, it, well, so uh, that was an important cultural uh, realization. There, uh, there was also this other event in which I think you were closely involved and. Like your personal perspective of the the 1968 Joint Fall computer, oh, my favorite demonstration. The it was the there is no other demonstration that's right. like it. It that's was right. the that's right. That's right. So uh, your it was sense, wonderful. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I should tell you that uh, Doug uh, approached me with some trepidation in, uh, long before that conference, saying, "You know, we're thinking about this, uh, trying to do this demo." of NLS at the Fall Joint, uh, and the Fall Joint's, of course, going to be held in the auditorium in San Francisco, <clears throat> and we can't, we're going to have to figure out a way to uh, demonstrate it on the stage at, in, at the auditorium and with, by being connected to the system at SRI, it's 40 miles down the peninsula in Menlo Park. So we're a little, I, you know, do you think we ought to do this? I said, yes, go for it, please. And he said, well, uh, it's going to be expensive. I said, fine, we'll pay for it. <clears throat> now, uh, and so we did, and I came out to see it, and it worked beautifully. Um, now, someone ap apparently told Doug, I found this out much later, someone, uh, maybe a contracting officer or something, some government uh, official, told Doug uh, when Doug uh, told him what, they were going to do and how much money it was going to cost. This uh, contracting officer said, uh, uh, well, all right, if FARPA says go ahead, then fine, but uh, if something goes wrong with this demo, I'm going to deny knowing anything about it. So I, you were there for the actual... Oh, yeah, 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 and it was wonderful. Now, let me, let me tell you some, some things about um, some effects that, uh, you, that people, by and large, don't know about. Uh, that's the fall and spring joint computer conferences were the s largest uh, computer conferences of their day in in the, in the 60s, <clears throat> and uh, one the the eastern uh, the spring was usually held on the east coast and the fall usually on the west coast. So uh, all of the people involved in the research that ARPA was supporting would would go to these things, and most of those people. Uh, over several years, uh, most of the people in the other ARPA-supported places had ignored Doug's work and the work at SRI. Uh, the uh, and many of the other uh, people supported by ARPA were people out of the traditional hard sciences, but in background. I mean, there were, there were no computer scientists as such in those days because there was no PhD program in computer science until about 67, 65, 67. <clears throat> so, so these people who were doing this research were, had been trained in physics or math or electrical engineering, 
there are a few people in, out of linguistics, a few out of experimental psychology. <clears throat> but uh, the hard scientists, so-called, uh, uh, ignored the SRI work because it didn't have any of these hard science properties from their point of view. Huh? And so you're using the computer to do what? You're going to have people writing stuff and editing stuff and working with it through meetings and things like that? Well, I don't know. Well, these, those folks were blown away by this demo. I mean, they had, they had never seen anything like it. They had never blown away an audience themselves the way this audience was blown away. So it made a huge impact on, on a set of people that you'd never think of impacting in this way, you know. Were there actually gasps? I mean, could you feel the, the visceral reaction? Yeah, I, you could feel, it was electricity. I mean, I, I, don't remember, I don't remember sounds particularly, except at the end. I mean, you got a standing ovation. Uh, and then the, and the place then they erupted in, in people buzzing, everybody talking to everybody else, you know, uh, with excitement. Yeah, it was great.